Tonight's speaker is Ben Sanders. He's a direct descendant of Wilbur Fisk Sanders and has committed decades to the study and assembly of accurate information on his famous relative. A published artist, historian, and data analyst, analyst, his writing brings a unique perspective to Montana history. Tonight, he'll be speaking about Montana's first US senator. Was he a vigilante, a hero, a villain? Ben Sanders' new book, Order Without Law, The Wilbur Fisk Sanders Story, tells the real history of this patriot, abolitionist, and champion of social justice. His talk will focus on those portions of the biography that are typically unfamiliar, debunking some of the common misconceptions regarding the controversial death of Thomas Francis Marr and Sanders' involvement with the vigilantes. And of course, books will be available at the back table for purchase and signing after the talk, so please stop by. And without further delay, welcome Ben Sanders. That's better. Awesome. So uh, I live in a little town called Mackey, Idaho, which is about five and a half hours down around the Lost River Range and up 93. It's about 400 people. And um, I graduated a passel of kids from the high school there. And at some point, my wife and I decided to leave uh, Mackey and go down to Huntsville, Alabama. and. Uh, finish a retirement that I had started. And uh, so we did that. We spent about 15 years down there. And in the process, uh, I uh, made some discoveries about a history that I had heard a great deal about as I was growing up about my ancestor and um, wrote a book. Uh, actually wrote two books. The other book uh, is about my other great-great-grandfather, but I'll get into him a little bit here after a bit. But uh, I really didn't intend for this to be anything more than a better story for my kids than the one I'd been told over decades. And uh, my family got some stuff wrong because that's what they do. And uh, I, I really got started, and I'm going to blame this book on Ancestry.com, TM. <laughs> and uh, the Montana Historical Society and a woman named Zoanne and a guy named uh, Jeff uh, from the photo archives. And, uh, but uh, as I was studying my ancestor and ancestry, I, uh, I realized that I wasn't going to find out very much about him online. And I also found out that ancestry is the kind of thing that you can put anything you want to into. And there's no sources. You can just make up all the kings and queens you come from. <laughs> and uh, so uh, my brother asked me one year if I wanted to come to Montana and uh, go fishing. And uh, I said, yeah, because he made a habit of leaving Huntsville, Alabama. Did I say I was living in Huntsville? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so he made a habit of leaving Huntsville and going to Glacier National Park every year. And so I said I'd go. And as it turned out, I decided I would uh, go visit my aunt. Her name is Claudia Sanders Brown. And uh, she lives in Missoula, where I graduated from high school in 1981. Uh, and she gave me a very rough uh, ancestry that had been prepared by a woman by the name of Natalie Rude Brown. And she was the second wife of a fellow by the name of Lewis Peck Sanders. So Wilbur Fisk Sanders, which is what this book is about, uh, he had three sons of whom he named no one Wilbur Fisk Sanders. He named them James Upson Sanders and um, uh, Lewis Peck Sanders was his youngest, and then Wilbur Edgerton Sanders was his middle boy. And so Jimmy and Willie were the two boys they brought with them when they traveled uh, 
from Akron, Ohio, and immigrated to the Idaho Territory in 63. But at any rate, uh, when I started uh, talking to my aunt, uh, I realized that I needed to go talk to some people that actually knew something about Montana history and Wilbur Fitz Sanders. So I went to the Montana Historical Society. And in a folder that was a box marked uh, the Sanders files, I found a series of letters, and most of them were to James, his oldest boy. And one was to my little cousin. And uh, I didn't know who that was. It didn't say. And it was dated in 1863. And it, it looked like it was addressed from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But the writing was foreign to me in those pen and ink days, you know, those crow's quills days. And uh, lo and behold, I found out much later that uh, what that meant was that he had written his cousin, Martha Edgerton, from the battlefield of Shiloh. Uh, and uh, that took some, some real research, but it dawned on me that I was living in Huntsville, Alabama, and the Shiloh battlefield was right up the street. And so uh, as I dug into it uh, and I talked to my aunt some more, I found out about William Francis Fitzgerald, my other great-great-grandfather, who was the father of a woman by the name of um, Helen uh, Fitzgerald Sanders. And she wrote uh, a couple books, one's called Trail Through Western Woods, and the other's called uh, The White Quiver, and they're about the Blackfeet Indians in Montana around Flathead Lake, and as a result, they inducted her into the tribe. Of course, it was a perspective of their culture from the white uh, perspective, but she was about the only one writing uh, anything about uh, their tribe at the time and made an attempt to preserve them. And uh, as it turned out, her father uh, fought at the Battle of Shiloh, and Sanders happened to make the second day of the Battle of Shiloh kind of late. And um, the two were within about 100 yards of each other on the Hamburg Purdy Road. And 30 years later, their kids got married in San Francisco. Uh, so that's kind of my family history and what uh, compelled me to write this book. And I have another manuscript for another book that may get published one day about William Francis Fitzgerald. So at any rate, um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with uh, Wilbur Fitz Sanders, uh, <clears throat> based on the idea that you may have seen his statue in the Capitol building on the second floor of the Grand Staircase. Um, he was Montana's first senator in a fairly controversial election. Uh, and as it turned out, the Republican Party was in control of the Congress at the time, so they made their decision to select T.C. Powers and Wilbur Fitz Sanders and seated them in the Senate. Uh, he's also known a little bit for uh, the vigilantes of Montana. And um, <clears throat> as I did a, a considerable amount of research, I discovered that um, he really only was prosecutor in a single trial against uh, George Ives in Nevada City. And, and even though Langford and Callaway like to name him as the prosecutor of the uh, vigilantes, he, he really didn't have a tremendous amount to do with them. He was a practice, practicing lawyer. He certainly couldn't found his practice on the idea that he was involved in extra legal hangings on a daily basis. So. As far as that uh, trend ran, uh, I, I, my research didn't really support the idea that he was the chief of the vigilantes, although <clears throat> he was a fairly vain fellow. Um, he did uh, uh, make comments to the press years later uh, in Washington that, uh, that uh, he used to run those fellows, you know, uh, when he was being interviewed. And, uh, but I think uh, in the twilight of his political career, he kind of hung on to the glory days, and whenever somebody in the Senate at the time he served patted him on the back for, you know, uh, bringing law to the territory, he didn't uh, deny uh, the compliment. So um, he also uh, was an abolitionist. He was a very adamant abolitionist. 
And when he arrived in Bannock, so uh, he and Edgerton, his uh, uncle, Sidney Edgerton, uh, who had been appointed as Chief Justice to the Territory of Idaho by Abraham Lincoln, arrived in about Fort Hall. Uh, I'll cover this later. He uh, uh, was a fairly young, skinny, 26-year-old kid. And, and this is a picture of him here. Uh, when he arrived uh, in uh, Bannock, um, he was really uh, just a, intending to be a practicing lawyer. And uh, he was asked to try the case. And uh, even though he had his wife and his two young children with him, uh, he accepted the job. But um, that, of course, took place in Nevada City. And um, at the time, he was threatened. Uh, his life was threatened after that trial. And he sought protection from a group called the, the League of Protection. Uh, and um, they made a pact. And from that point forward, ex Beadler was pretty much the chief of that group and a fellow by the name of Captain James Williams. Um, he wasn't very intimidating looking and if you uh, look at him, you'll see that uh, he was fairly young and it wasn't, he wasn't the kind of guy that you would have put a whole lot of confidence in. But uh, I, um, when he uh, left home from Leon, Lyon, New York, and went to Akron, Ohio to study law with his uncle, Sidney. Um, he, uh, boy, I'm getting real tied up. He, uh, married a young lady by the name of, and this is a more uh, familiar picture of him, uh, probably when he was in his 50s. Uh, he met a young woman by the name of Harriet Peck Fenn. Uh, she was a school teacher, and they uh, later fell in love and got married. Uh, she was the love of his life. He uh, built a house here in Helena. It's now called the, it's the Sanders Bed and Breakfast. And um, she was pretty much behind the design of that, that house. Uh, and he did just about anything she asked him to. Uh, but she followed him everywhere, and she was a pretty sturdy woman. She was uh, a, uh, the president of the Women's League here in Helena. Uh, she was a women's suffrage activist. When the uh, library burned down in um, Helena here, uh, she went and collected all the newspapers from Wilbur Fisk Sanders' library and uh, brought them to the rebuilt uh, Montana Historical Society uh, archives. And so if you go look at the um, Library of Congress newspapers, uh, you'll see a number of the early Montana papers have Wilbur Fisk Sanders written across the top of them. Um, not that, any, that a good deal of them even say anything about him in that paper, but they probably came from his personal collection. So um, they had five kids. Harriet had five kids, as said. So uh, we believe that two of them died either uh, during miscarriages or uh, during birth. There's no names for those uh, children, but there was the three boys. Uh, my father is Wilbur Fisk Sanders III. His father was Wilbur Fisk Sanders Jr., and he was the son of Louis Peck, uh, as I said earlier. Sidney Edgerton, uh, his uncle, was uh, a lawyer in Akron. He was also a senator for the state of Ohio. And he was appointed by Abraham Lincoln to be chief justice of the territory of Idaho. When he got here, Wallace decided that he wanted to assign him to the far east of the territory because he considered him to be an undesirable easterner. And so about the time they got to Fort Hall, and after they happened to run into a woman by the name of Electra Bryan, uh, 
who was the new wife of a fellow by the name of Henry Plummer, uh, and then later near Market Lake ran into George Ives, who was very friendly to them and showed them some gold, and this was probably uh, not long after he survived the Stuart Yellowstone expedition where the crow just about wiped out the entire party. And so he, he made it through all that only to be hung in Nevada City for killing a young man by the name of Nicholas Tebolt, uh, who was a young German uh, over a, a pair of mules, uh, ostensibly. So, um, Before they came to the Idaho Territory, uh, Sanders fought in the Civil War. And uh, when the war broke out, Harriet Sanders and Mary Edgerton essentially turned the law offices of Upson and Edgerton, which was on the corner of uh, Hall, they called it Hall's Corner, in Akron into a recruiting station, and Sanders recruited a company of infantry and a battery of artillery. Um, he then traveled with General Buell down to meet uh, Grant at, at uh, Shiloh. It was a horrible journey that they took. Uh, uh, they suffered tremendously and they missed the entire uh, battle. So after they showed up, they then went to Corinth, Mississippi it took them forever because uh, if you've ever heard anything about Shiloh, you'll know that the Confederates about overran the entire Union Army there and drove them into the Tennessee River. But uh, overnight, Buell arrived and uh, pushed General uh, PTG Beauregard back to uh, Corinth. And then he staged a tremendous ruse and snuck his army out of Corinth during the night only to allow them to survive uh, that siege. So Buell then uh, traveled across. So here's the corner of Hall. <laughs> and uh, there's a couple of figures, actually three here in top hats. And that's exactly the place where their law office was. Got a little ahead of myself. And then uh, they had a lot of the uh, pre-war union rallies right there in the street. and. There's a figure with a top hat right there. Uh, and there's a couple more in the back over here. And uh, they weren't really common in the streets then. So they're, you know, I don't claim that that's Wilbur Fist Sanders. But uh, the period is correct, and it, it could very possibly be. So he was involved. He made several speeches on the streets during that time. So you know, uh, it, it, there's a chance. So this is a map that's in the book. Uh, those two pictures of um, Hall's Corner are not in the book. Uh, this picture is in the book. This is a, a later picture of Harriet Sanders that's not in the book. Uh, this is about the same age as Wilbur is here. And uh, so Wilbur Fitz Sanders died of cancer. And he died of cancer that manifested in his nose and in his eye. And so this is probably about the time that he started writing letters to James to explain that he was suffering from growths that were, that were bothering and he was becoming uh, quite sick. Um, so this map shows how Buell's army traveled down to Shiloh and then made their way across northern Alabama. As like I said earlier, I lived in Huntsville. And, uh, it occurred to me that I could, could learn a lot right there about Wilberforce Sanders and during his service during the Civil War. And one of the things I found out, and one of the things that had always perplexed me, was that uh, he didn't uh, resign his commission over health, which is what's normally written. Uh, in fact, when I went to the National Archives, there was no record of uh, any health condition related to his service. Uh, Harriet received a widow's pension because he had been a senator entirely. And uh, his son, the lawyer, James, uh, fought th for that for his mother. Uh, he died not a very rich man, Wilbur Fisk. Uh, the house was about all he owned. And uh, <clears throat> so the family gave that up uh, not too long after uh, her death. 
But at any rate, um, as it turned out, Wilberforce Sanders had been given an order to return slaves to their masters that had been indentured by Buell's army to work on the railroads. So Morgan, Smith, and Forrest are three Confederate general names that are pretty well known in terms of cavalry activity, and they tore up the tracks. And so this triangle of tracks from Corinth to Chattanooga was their main, uh, they called them lines of communication, but it was their food. So, and then from Nashville to Chattanooga, and then this other route out here uh, wasn't really uh, timely enough, all the way out to Memphis for them to get uh, resupplied with food. So Sanders was uh, supposed to, uh, this is, these are pictures of Shiloh, and I'm about to show you a picture of uh, Shiloh that's not uh, a very good picture. It's not of Shiloh either. It's a, an example of the carnage that occurred during the Civil War. And Sanders didn't fight in the fight. He showed up to a battlefield that was literally strewn with thousands of dead soldiers and animals. And this would have probably been a pretty traumatic thing for him, and because he was an adjutant to, uh, by then, um, General James, a um, General Garfield, uh, who replaced Forsyth, who was the original commander of the 64th, uh, he would have been probably put on burial detail as a lieutenant. And uh, so, the, one of the reasons the carnage was so bad, and I'm not gonna stay on this picture very long, it's fairly grotesque, and there's no real point, um, uh, rifling had been introduced to weaponry at that time in the Civil War, and suddenly a distance that might have got uh, a smoothbore musket shot uh, to your enemy hit exactly where they aimed. And so the numbers are dead at Shiloh. It was the bloodiest battle uh, in, the, in America to that date, uh, including every war. Uh, that had preceded it. Now, there were much bloodier battles in the Civil War, Antietam and Gettysburg and the like, but this was the first real bloody one, and Sanders probably would have been, you know, he's 25, and he's burying uh, his comrades, and, you know, these were all real young kids, so I think that would have probably been a pretty traumatic thing for him. When he got to Stevenson, Alabama, he resigned his commission over the order to return slaves, and at that time, he uh, came across... Uh, a fellow by the name of Frank Mitchell, who was a runaway slave that had belonged to a private in the Confederate Army. And Frank begged Sanders to take him with him, and he did. He put him in uh, a job in the kitchen of the uh, 64th Ohio and kind of smuggled him all the way from actually Iuka, Mississippi, all the way over to Stevenson. After Sanders resigned his commission, he took him all the way up through Kentucky and had a heck of a time getting him across the Ohio River because Kentucky officials would not let him take Frank out of the South because he didn't have ownership papers of him. And so he went to an old general friend of his and got some paperwork made up and then brought him all the way to Akron, Ohio, where Frank lived to be 112 years old <laughs> and died the oldest Buckeye in the state at the time. Uh, so they had a lifelong friendship, and uh, Mitchell would bring Sanders pheasants and all kinds of gifts over the course of his life, and he lived an awfully long time. Uh, and so there's uh, a, 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 news, a nice newspaper article about that that uh, Jeff Malcolmson told me about. I had no idea. Uh, in studying history, you can't know everything. You can't discover everything. You write a book uh, like this and the next thing you know it's printed and somebody comes up to you and says, I found out something or I didn't find out something. I already knew something that you don't know about your relative and you're scrambling to figure out how to treat it. And this is a good time for me to say that Mark Johnson uh, opened my eyes to something that happened in the 52nd Congress over the Chinese Exclusion Act. Actually, it was an amendment to the Chinese Exclusion Act where Sanders used some pretty uh, inflammatory uh, rhetoric in terms of the extinction of the Chinese from America. Uh, before that, Sanders had in 79 uh, made comments in one of his many delegate runs that he lost for the delegate seat um, 
to represent, excuse me, the Montana Territory in Washington, uh, where his opponent uh, claimed in the papers that Sanders was the pro-Chinese labor candidate and try to use that against him. Sanders referred to uh, that particular claim and said that the Chinese Exclusion Act was barbarous, undemocratic, unrepublican, and against progressive principles. So he took that stance early on and, and that was in the press. The things he said in the Senate Never really left the Senate. He didn't go out on the street and speak against the Chinese, and especially Chinese labor. Sanders, uh, by that time, was also, and he had to uh, kind of resign that. He only was in the Senate for three years, and then he went back to being the full-time attorney for the Northern Pacific Railroad. So he would have been very in favor of cheap labor. Uh, for the Northern Pacific, which uh, he represented. And then um, in 97, he uh, represented the Chinese in Butte uh, against a union boycott that was primarily Irish. And uh, over the course of several years and into the 1900s, he ultimately ended up winning that case. And so he didn't get, uh, any real retribution for Chinese laborers in Butte, but he did get the, the, the unions to stop. And that, that uh, you know, that was a position that he was fairly passionate about. So why did he say the things that he said about the Chinese Exclusion Act in the Senate? So if you examine all three days of the debates over the amendment, a good deal of it was over free silver. And I think that Sanders only <clears throat> spoke in terms of promoting a bill that he felt was going to defeat free silver because at the time silver uh, wasn't free, but it was uh, reduced to a ratio of 16 to one where its value in the global market was 32 to one. So any silver that left the United States could be sold overseas for a fairly good profit. And he said that that was against sound money and that it hurt the economy of the United States. That's what he said. Um, so I like to get ahead of myself on slides. Uh, here's an example of one of the bridges that he uh, worked on at the defenses of during the Civil War. These are bunk houses that they would put on both ends and he was responsible for riding around on the train and uh, making sure that the, these fortifications were being built. So his section of, of road was the Nashville to Decatur, Alabama section, and that rail no longer exists. It's now a non-motorized walking trail, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, but these uh, indentured slaves uh, were pretty prevalent, and the, and the people that wanted them back uh, were very aware of the fact that they had provided intelligence to the Union, and um, it, it, they were probably going to be, uh, 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 you know, abused for having given information to the Union uh, considerably. Uh, after the war, before he came to uh, the Idaho Territory, he uh, was a member of the Squirrel Hunters in Cincinnati, and they defended the, the city of Cincinnati uh, briefly against what they believed to be was another threat from Morgan and Smith, the Confederate cavalry generals. Uh, this is the route they took. The landers cut off from Big Piney to Fort Hall and Soda Springs proved to be very difficult. Sanders was sick the majority of that section of the trip. And then they made it to, to Bannock, of course. Uh, Bannock, as James described it, was bang up. Uh, it looks like uh, bunk, I think is what he said. Uh, it was not a, a very big town. It was a, a, a messy mining camp. And um, so uh, I live in a valley just west 
about three valleys over from Bannock uh, and about this time of year, which is pretty uh, close to the time of year that they would have decided not to continue on to Lewiston. Uh, it's getting pretty cold, so I'm not saying they weren't lured by gold, but it was probably a, a good choice not to continue to travel west when he knew he, the Edgerton was going to come right back. Uh, this map doesn't exist anywhere that I've been able to find except this little drawing that I did that's in the book, and it's not a very good one. But it kind of lays out the grasshopper, crick, and bannock, and the rattlesnake, and where all the Henry Plummer business uh, and the road agents uh, took place. And then, you know, they talk a lot about riding <coughs> Sanders rode a donkey to the rattlesnake uh, one night. He, there's a story he uh, published about the, the rattlesnake ranch and a guy named Gallagher trying to kill him. Uh, but, um, and then the locations along the Ruby River that at that time was called the Persimmerai, uh, and Nevada City and Virginia City. Uh, after the hanging of Stinson, Ray, and Henry Plummer, uh, Sanders' involvement with the Montana Territory was chiefly surrounded around the governors. Of course, he had a lot of interaction with Sidney Edgerton, who did quite a bit of work on uh, gathering the code and, uh, and publishing the code that was really borrowed from the Idaho Territory Code. Uh, he, he had a pretty good blowout with the legislation, the first legislature, over the Organic Act and its uh, portioning of representatives in the various districts. Uh, and then he left to go back east. Uh, and by that time, Lincoln had been assassinated. Uh, Andrew Johnson was now the president, and he was a Democrat. And he told uh, Edgerton that he was no longer needed in the Montana Territory. And Edgerton fought very hard to retain the governorship, but he uh, ultimately was relieved. In the interim, Thomas Francis Marr, the secretary, showed up about three days before Edgerton left, and uh, he handed him over the acting governorship. Marr had a big mess on his hands. He had to try to put together a legislature, a special session. Sanders stood firmly against him on that uh, particular topic, and they, uh, they kind of fought it out from there. A fellow by the name of Robert Fisk was the, and his six brothers were the editors of the Montana Herald at the time, and he went to war with Marr. Uh, I cover it fairly well in um, the, uh, the book. And ultimately, uh, Marr, of course, uh, drowns at Fort Benton. And uh, we all know the story that uh, goes behind that. Uh, a fellow by the name of Timothy Egan wrote a book called The Immortal Irishman that commits about a third of the book to the theory that Sanders was behind his killing. Um, you can decide for yourself, but my foreword is written by a fellow by the name of Paul R. Wiley, who wrote a book called The Irish General, uh, Thomas Francis Marr, and I suggest you read his book because he does an incredible job at a very comprehensive collection of all the evidence surrounding the death of Thomas Francis Marr. He didn't have a lot to do with uh, many of the other governors except for Benjamin Potts. And uh, he was a Republican and Sanders went to war with Potts. And, and um, so did uh, um, Robert uh, Fisk. So a lot of people that don't know who Willie, Wilbur Fisk Sanders is like to, 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 to say that his name is Wilbur Fisk. And so I think they kind of confused those two guys. But uh, that's just because they haven't studied. Um, so uh, Potts reigned uh, as uh, governor, appointed governor for three terms. And he did some tremendous things for the territory. He was an excellent governor. He's probably one of the best in the territory period. Um, uh, the others, Sanders really didn't have a whole lot to do with. He was more busy dealing with. Uh, the Union Pacific Railroad and uh, a number of his uh, own pet projects in terms of politics, and you can read uh, about that in the book as well. Uh, 
so by the time uh, Joseph K. Toole became the first governor of the state and Sanders was in the Senate, um, he didn't really have a whole lot to do with those governors either until uh, he later represented two Northern Cheyenne Indians by the names of Spotted Eagle and Little Whirlwind, near the end of his life, actually. And um, those two uh, Northern Cheyennes were <clears throat> accused and convicted of the murder of a sheep herder by the name of Hoover. And um, Sanders uh, worked with uh, George Bird Grinnell and uh, the Native American Rights League to, to acquit the, the two uh, braves from their uh, imprisonment, which he succeeded in doing after the terms of Smith. And finally then when Joseph K. Toole, who was not a fan of Sanders, finally came into office and he did acquit uh, Little Whirlwind and Spotted Hawk. So I spoke earlier of Free Silver and the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, and I think I've covered that well. The book also briefly talks about the, the Republican Party's position on that. Does not go into the kind of detail that Mark covers. But fortunately, I self-published, and so my, auth my uh, a uh, publisher will allow me to update my book whenever I want to, and so if you buy one of the earlier ones, you'll get a little different level of information, but not different. Uh, and, and, and a bunch of uh, spelling corrections as well. Um, then, of course, you know, uh, Sanders ultimately defending the Chinese in Butte really went against uh, the, his voting with the Senate. Uh, to, in my opinion, defeat Free Silver, but then again, uh, words matter, and I'm not excusing him from uh, the, the words that he used to uh, drive out the Chinese from the United States. It was an extremely racist time. Uh, the stuff they used to put in papers in those days, it was just unbelievable. And uh, uh, we still got a lot of work to go in that, case, in that regard. Uh, I just spoke of the case of Little Whirlwind and Spotted Hawk. I'm really doing a terrible job on these slides, aren't I? <laughs> uh, so um, the statue of Wilberforce Sanders resides currently on the second floor uh, of the Grand Staircase. When I was a kid, uh, probably 10 or 12, uh, I first saw it outside in the back. And originally it was on the ground floor of the Rotunda. Um, there's some people that like to say that <clears throat> they don't like the fact that it was moved around uh, as much as it has been. I actually think its current location is excellent. And I could not find anything that supported any kind of animus towards Sanders that had anything to do with the statue. So it is what it is. Uh, that concludes my uh, discussion of the book. Uh, if there are any questions, I don't know what our time looks like right now. Uh, We've got a, a little bit, right? At least, At least 20 minutes. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to entertain those. Yes, sir. What was the power of, the, of a senator from a territory as opposed to already so, established uh, states? He couldn't be a senator for the territory. They only uh, had delegates. So. All the delegate contests that Sanders ran for that he lost uh, were when it was a territory and it was only for the delegate position. I think uh, Martin McGinnis uh, might have dominated that, but every single one of those was won by a Democrat except for Claggett, who was during the Potts era. It's for our recording. Oh, oh, okay. Can you talk a little bit more about free silver? I've heard and read about it, but I really don't understand what the whole free silver thing was about. So the idea was that the industries, in particular the gold mining, 
dominated the economy. And it really hurt a lot of farmers. Uh, and so the idea was that free silver, which was never free silver, it quickly became a reduced valued silver to 16 to 1, was supposed to benefit them at the market, which it would, uh, except for a few of the farmers back east. So the idea was to bolster the middle class, or the, if that's what you wanted to call farmers in those days. Uh, but uh, it failed ultimately during the Morgan silver dollar period, and the entire US monetary system was revamped at that time. So it never was free. Uh, it was reduced in, in value significantly. Thank you. Very nice job. Uh, powerful connection to your, your family's history. What was his involvement in abolitionism? You know, that where, he's, where he was based in Ohio had a lot of, uh, a hotbed of abolitionism. What was he involved with there? How did his sentiments become known in that regard? So Sanders was quite an orator uh, before the war uh, that was one of the primary forms of entertainment. Uh, there's a couple of books. One of them is called The Cincinnati Queen that covers the, the kinds of rhetoric that were used. Uh, Sanders really didn't speak a whole lot about abolition, uh, ab abolitionism in Akron uh, at the time. Um, it was only after the war. Uh, so, um, you know, Lincoln made a statement that if he could end the war without freeing a single slave, he would. Uh, and he, and, you know, but he was not a radical Republican. He was a Republican, and uh, the radical Republicans demanded ultimately that slaves be freed and given the same status as whites in America and the right to vote. Uh, so I could not find any real uh, evidence that he spoke much on abolition prior to arriving in Bannock. And that was a largely uh, democratic, pro-slavery, confederate uh, mining camp. Uh, he kind of kept his mouth shut. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. No, you go first. That's fine. <laughs> Sir. Well, we're going to start here because I'm, I'm going to You're run running the thing. I'm going to run out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to have to. I'm curious if he knew that his wife gave away all his newspaper collection to the new library after they rebuilt it after the fire and how he felt about that. So I believe that he absolutely knew that uh, from what I was able to discern from everything that I've studied. He was a big part of the Montana Historical Society. He was the president for some 30 years, I believe, and um, uh, he didn't found it, but, you know, like I said, Sanders was kind of an arrogant fellow, and he really liked being known for... Uh, putting his stamp on the Montana Historical Society. Uh, some writers have uh, claimed that he had an influence in the writing of the very large three volumes of A History of Montana by Helen Fitzgerald Sanders. Uh, and I can't really find much evidence of that. He may have had a pretty good hand in Progressive Men of Montana, which has a couple ladies in it too. Uh, but uh, as far as that goes, I think he was glad to, to give anything to the society at that point because he, it was kind of his, in his mind anyway. Refresh my memory on the border, the western border of Montana and Idaho. Edgerton was the judge, right? And then he comes over to Montana. Is there, as as you look at the states, western expansion, what are they, seven degrees and four degrees? So, and yet, but you look at Montana, and there's the Bitterroots. And we don't go north from Wyoming. Right. Does that, does that question make any sense It to absolutely you? does. So I was not able to come across anything that defined where they placed the border. Uh, 
Of course, Edgerton went to Washington with gold in his pockets, uh, actually sewn into the lining of his coat to uh, argue. Actually, it was paid largely by citizens of Alder Gulch uh, for the separation of Montana and Idaho. It's a mystery how Wallace, who was the Idaho territorial governor, allowed the border to land where it did because it really advantaged Montana. Uh, the bitter was highly valued by the Native Americans for its ri richness, and it's absolutely a very fertile valley, and I just can't imagine Idaho just giving that up. So the, the politics, Ashley, uh, James Ashley was heavily involved. He was one of, he was an acting governor, I think. Uh, actually, he was a, a governor that was uh, appointed uh, to the territory in Grant Candon because he was uh, saying things against Grant's administration. But Ashley had a big hand in uh, that bill. Um, so uh, I, I really couldn't find anything that spoke to the definition of the border. Because if you look at the map, Butte and Missoula should be in Idaho. You know, at that, with the four degrees, seven degrees. So I think that, I think it was, I think it was purely politics. I think that uh, the administration didn't support Wallace any longer. And uh, favored Ashley for some reason. He was not a real popular fellow. Sir. Um, what in particular, when Sanders went back to Washington with some other folks to get the second and third sessions, territorial sessions, taken away, basically, what in particular were they upset about in those sessions? I believe it was purely control. Uh, the, the Republicans were struggling. They were, they were not powerful. Sanders was just really fanatical about supporting the party. Um, and so uh, I think that initially uh, all the Republicans in Dimsdale makes this real clear, uh, felt jaded by Marr. Uh, Marr was appointed by uh, a Democratic administration and he uh, felt like he had been used by Edgerton and Sanders and some of the other Republicans as a tool to advantage the, the party, uh, you know, including uh, the activities in the Senate. You know, Sanders was, and Mark said the same thing when I asked him. He was a lawyer and he was a politician and I wouldn't put it past him or any other member of that profession to at times use some Machiavellian tactics to get what they wanted. Uh, you mentioned that um, Wilbur Fisk, Fisk Sanders practiced law in Bannock. My question is, uh, what sort of law would exist in a wild west territorial town at that time? Good question. <clears throat> because there wasn't, um, what he did was he advised people over mining disputes almost entirely. And he used the Idaho Code uh, and the way it described and the, uh, the silver shelves and other areas uh, west into Washington and the rulings that had been made over those disputes. In particular, there were some uh, practices of digging over into another mining claim. And so I think he just collected money to give people advice to argue their case against other miners. And of course, everything was carried out by a miners court which was just popular opinion and so if the crowd agreed with you if the if your neighbors all agreed with you you didn't probably stand up against them by the time the vigilantes came along uh, certainly people were very careful about not being uh, in line with popular opinion so he, he until uh, the code was published, uh, and at, that was after Montana became a state, uh, he really didn't have a foundation to practice law, but he did. He even hung on a shingle. 
There's been a lot of talk about Republican versus and Democratic parties going on here, but could you talk a little bit about how the parties at that time in the 1860s in particular were different than they are today, so people have a different perspective on it? So there's a lot of debate over how that actually was and is and when it changed. There's a, it's referred to, uh, as my friend Jim pointed out, uh, a flip. But it wasn't a flip, it was a transition in pieces and parts that I was able to, to discern. The South was democratic, they were Democrats, and they were considered conservative. And they certainly didn't want to give up the right to own slaves, and they were following uh, uh, the idea that uh, expansion of slavery into the territories was a right and it was in line with the idea that America was an agricultural country. Mining was still burgeoning early on, especially during the Civil War. But as, uh, and then the Republicans, of course, Lincoln was actually a moderate party. The Whigs and the Democrats were the two parties, so they were a <laughs> non-Democrat, non-Republic party, uh, the moderate party that just appeared. Uh, and won, oddly, and uh, uh, there, you know, Sanders called himself a liberal and a progressive, and so he, uh, if you want to call the Democratic Party of today liberal and progressive, that would go flatly against what the uh, uh, Democrat Party was during the Civil War and immediately afterwards, and the Republican Party was, uh, you know, certainly isn't what I would consider today a liberal party uh, or progressive. So that's just my opinion in terms of politics. But everybody has their own point of view on what those parties look like and stand for and how they actually practice. I think they're ever-changing. I think both of them are, and I think they're kind of looking at maybe something happening again. Uh, we'll see what Mr. Manchin does. <laughs> So the title of your book is Order Without Law. And then could you explain a little bit more about how Wilbur Fitz Sanders got to Fort Benton and how he got connected with X Beadler and and we listened to <coughs> X Beadler a couple Sorry. of weeks ago and it, um, Sanders seemed to have a big influence on X Beadler and so I was just wondering if you could expand on, on their relationship and the things happening in Fort Benton at the time. Sure. Um, so I got a little bit to unpack there, so you might have to remind me of part of it if I forget. So Harriet took the boys back east because her mother had been writing her not happy about her daughter out in the wilderness, and so she went back to... Um, New York to collect her mom and bring her out to the territory. Uh, ultimately, and a nephew. And ultimately that failed uh, because she finally talked her mom into not coming out to, uh, to the territory. And so uh, Harriet made the decision to, to get on a boat. Uh, Wilbur was with her initially, but then he came back separately and she rode a steamboat all the way to Fort Benton, and it took them an enormous amount of time to get there. They were very late, and Sanders went to meet Harriet at Fort Benton. Um, Marr arrived at Benton. He was actually supposed to pick up weapons there, and he found out that they had also stalled downriver, and he was going to head south uh, down the river to collect those weapons. So he, Sanders wasn't there for any other reason than to collect his wife and kids. Uh, ex Beadler. Helen Fitzgerald was fascinated with X. Beadler, and she wrote a, a nice little book about him, and I have a lot of copies of the notes that she made prior to writing that book. And uh, I don't think Sanders himself, I don't think Wilbur had a whole lot to do with X. Beadler. Uh, Beadler was kind of an antagonistic guy. He's the one that hollered out in the middle of the trial about, you know, what about the Dutchmen uh, when they were uh, coming to their conviction of Ives. And, um, I don't find any writings or evidence that, that he had a lot of interaction with Beadler. Did I miss anything? Well, uh, it's just interesting in this 
your view of the gentleman we listened to two weeks ago about their relationships? <laughs> I didn't study Beadler uh, except where. You said they were wonderful friends, and Sanders and Beadler were hand in hand in a lot of the events in Fort Benton, and Beadler's grave has Sanders' order without law statement on it. And, right. And he just, it just is a different view. So I was just curious. Sure. I, I kind of feel like they admired each other in their own ways, but they, are, they were different men. Sanders was not, he didn't have the, the intestinal fortitude to kill somebody, in my opinion. Beadler had no problem at all. <laughs> and uh, uh, they admired each other. Uh, Sanders, if, in, from what I study, if he, he didn't, and he really wasn't the kind of guy that, that acted like he disliked someone. If he disagreed with him, he was nasty. He was horrible to him. And he pulled no punches. And uh, uh, if he was your friend or not your enemy, I think he was uh, very enduring of anybody that did anything substantial. So I just think it was a, a mutual respect, in my opinion. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering about some dates. When did he, Wilbur Fisk Sanders, come to um, Bannock, and when did he come to Helena? He came to Bannock in 63, uh, following the war, <laughs> and after a short stay in Akron, uh, and then he traveled to, to Nevada City and moved to Virginia City first. Um, and I don't recollect the exact date that he moved to Helena. Uh, it's in the book, uh, but I'm not a really good date guy. Uh, uh, I, I make sure I, I get a lot of sources. And so my source reference table is pretty good. And, uh, so at whatever date it was that he moved here, uh, I'm not entirely certain what that date was. Up here. I go look it up in my book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe I missed it, but Helen was Wilbur's granddaughter? Or, or did Helen Sanders? So Helen Fitzgerald uh, met Lewis Peck, his youngest son in San Francisco, on his way to the Spanish-American War and married oh, him. So married she's his daughter-in-law. Daughter-in-law, uh, okay. They eloped. And uh, apparently Sanders was not happy about the fact his son eloped with this southern, southern daughter of a confederate. And uh, the family tradition goes that the two d disdained each other, even though they had very similar views. But one was a rebel and the other was a union. Hmm. She was, must have been pretty well educated. And she was very did well educated. Did the family name quite well? She, she did, except she had an affair on Lewis and oh. had a child uh, out of wedlock. And he, okay. he offered to, uh, to stay with her and raise the child as, own, as his own. And she said goodbye. And she went to China. She went to uh, New York. She traveled the world with B, her daughter, and uh, didn't have a whole lot to do with uh, Lewis uh, ever again. He married a woman by the name of Natalie Rude Brown, who wrote a huge uh, ancestry on the family and left out the ex-wife entirely, <laughs> uh, which kind of teed me off because I didn't even know about Wilbur. Yeah. I mean, William Francis Fitzgerald until my aunt told so me. So there's a book there, too. There's a big book there. Yeah. <laughs> That's your third book. And speaking of books, I know in, in the back of your book, you have some appendices almost where you have historical arguments back and forth with people whose interpretations you disagree with, correct? Absolutely. Right? And so in the back of it, you know, if you want to pick up a copy, I think they're going to be for sale soon. Um, you have a, a section about Tim Egan. Yes, sir. Tim Egan, the immortal Irishman, definitely took Mars' side in what we hear about what happened in Fort Bend. What, have, you, have you talked to Tim Egan? What would you say to him? What were your 
Uh, what did you think he did well? And what was his errors? It's maybe not fair to ask at 7.30 here. But, so I'll be really fast. Um, okay, I got a little time. So I reached out to Tim Egan, uh, the only way I knew how, which was Facebook. And, uh, uh, and he did not respond, and uh, that's fine. But um, when I read the book, and as you know, when uh, you did your presentation, I called you fairly quickly, uh, but we spoke afterwards. And so, um, by the way, uh, the Middle Kingdom under the big sky is phenomenal piece of work. Also for sale in our bookstore. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then, um, but uh, when I read the book, uh, I noticed that his sourcing was, in my opinion, a little loose. That's a kind way to put it. So he liked to cite uh, sources, but just the name of the book. He didn't give any page numbers, and there was just a ton of stuff with zero citation. No sources and no citation. And it seemed a little odd to me that he committed almost an entire third of his book to going after Sanders. So, you know, I had an editor by the name of <laughs> Sandy Bernan in uh, Arizona, and she was supposed to be my proofreader, but she ended up being a lot more than that. She was a little older than me, but uh, she said, did you write this book to defend your relative, Ben? And I said, I don't know. And she goes, well, did you? And I said, I guess so in a way. I guess I did. And I was already kind of reading Timothy's work. And she goes, well, then why don't you act like it? And I said, well, OK. <laughs> and so I didn't want to. I started going word for word. Uh, into everything he said. I found a video by a, a gal by the name of Angie Atkinson that was a park ranger at Gettysburg that, that kind of mirrored what he said. There's another fellow in there uh, that kind of capitalized on the most unscrupulous lawyer that ever practiced the profession line named Gary Forney, and you're not in there. <laughs> so I, I thought that your work was real sound. But those folks I just thought gave a little too loose of a description without much support, or if any, in some cases. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So I think we're going to conclude the formal part of our presentation, but these conversations can certainly continue with our speaker and as you make your way to our sign-up sheet and the book exhibit. Um, but give our speaker one more round of applause. Thank you.